So thanks for joining us on our first guest speaker episode of Better Business, Better Life. We're here today with Warner Cowan, who's here to talk to us about happy wife, happy life, <laughs> or more specifically, actually how he um, creates that space for both personal and family life, particularly as his wife, Liz, is actually a co-founder in the business. Yeah. So Warner, welcome. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks for having me. Lovely to have you here. Yeah. Great to have you as my first guest. Yeah. Hey, um, before we get started, I'd really like to understand a little bit about what it is your business does. So I know on the website it talks about being Australasia's leading technical tendering and procurement consultancy. But what does that really mean? Yeah, what does that mean? Um, very simply put, we help um, government agencies procure large pieces of infrastructure, engineering infrastructure like roads, bridges, rail, water, those types of things. And on the flip side, we help um, contractors and suppliers try and win government contracts as well. So okay. we did it across both New Zealand and Australia. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. And also, I'd like to get to people to know you a little bit more personally as well. So if I can ask you, um, a personal and professional success that you've had in the last year or so. Yeah. I mean, I as we chatted before, you know, 2020 was pretty crazy. So I, it's pretty hard to disconnect um, my personal and my professional life with how our team responded to the COVID crisis and in particular the lockdown. Um, you know, we had a, a pretty crazy year and when we sat down in December and reflected over it, over a few wines, we did incredibly well. We won a few awards. Um, we did well financially. Our reviews are down, but our margins were up. But, you know, we've had some real challenges. We've had, uh, you know, people who were working remotely that didn't have the right, you know, the right place where they could work or a safe place they could work. Um, we had challenges associated with the stress and anxiety of whether we were going to continue as a business like most organisations did. And so we had this kind of whole roller coaster type experience. And I think when you're uh, emotionally connected to your business, as most founders and entrepreneurs are, that's very really hard to disconnect the professional and personal. So how we ended up at the end of the year for us was probably for me the highlight or the this, you know, the highlight from a professional and personal perspective. Perfect. Tell me about uh, the awards. You won a couple of awards this year, is that right? Yeah. So 2020, we um, won the EY Procurement Supreme Award with one of our um, customers, which was which Yay. was phenomenal. High five. I know, <laughs> phenomenal, really. So that was a great team effort from our team, and yeah, uh, we um, got the we won the uh, best of the best for the Westpac Business Awards for strategy and planning. Um, we got announced last year, even though that was for 2019. So that was real significant for us. Fantastic. Um, and awards are really important, not not from a marketing perspective, but it makes the team feel really good about what we've done. And, and it's that third party endorsement that you're doing things right. So it was real real highlight for us. Congratulations to both you and the team. That's fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Now, I understand that you're a little bit of a late bloomer to this whole entrepreneurial yeah. business. So yeah. we'd like to just sort of set the scene and tell us how you started out. Well, I, I think, um, you know, just to understand, I, I was in the military when I left school at the university, I was in the Air Force, and then trundled through life, left the Air Force, went to the UK, got into construction. So I, I, I kind of jokingly say I never had a real job till I was about 34, uh, and then joined a corporate entity, joined Downers here in New Zealand. Um, that's how I really got involved in some serious construction activities is kind of linked to what we do now. Yep. Spent five years doing that and then uh, I got to a point where I kind of realised possibly I wasn't right for, for corporate world. I was looking for something a little bit different. So um, at the age of, really age of 39, nearly 40, Liz and I made a call to start our own business and that was pretty interesting because we had a two-month-year-old wow. at the time and a two-year-old and, um, you know, I was the single income earner in the family and we had a like everyone who owns a home in Auckland had a reasonably big mortgage <laughs> and stress. Um, yeah. And we made the call at a, at, a, at a later age to start a business and it was it was seven years ago now. So And so what was so Liz at that time was a full-time mum or yes. yeah? Yeah, she was, yeah. And so yeah. what made you decide to take that leap? Yeah, I look I think I think um I realized that life was very short. Um and actually I, I, I had confidence in my ability um to to create something. Yep. And I think, you know, there's always that anxiety when you go and look at starting a business around whether it's going to be successful or not. And I think Jim Collins um, talks about throwing pebbles first. Yeah, and I kind of was throwing a few pebbles and I was kind of sussing out whether I was going to hit the target or not before I fired the cannibal. And, um, you know, I was I, I was confident we had something there and I had Liz's full support, which was really important. Yep. Um, and so we, we pressed on. And I think, you know, we 
after two weeks, we've always been busy. So uh, and that's seven years ago now. And we've come out of a, a garage in Sandringham here in Auckland through to... I remember those days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> would, yeah. Um, through to, you know, we've got a team of um, of about 20, which includes our board and um, uh, some uh, full and part-time contractors as well. So, yeah, so we've really progressed. And do you still work full-time in the business? Uh, I, I kind of do. I mean, to be fair, I, I my business is my hobby, kind of weirdly. So I don't, I don't look at it as working. I, I genuinely love going into work and, and exploring new things and chasing new opportunities. I don't know what else I would do, to be honest. Yeah. I'm not great at sitting still and uh, – I, I don't. I don't. I don't have like hobbies that uh, consume time. I, I mean, we've got a young family, which yeah, consumes you got time. three children, right? Yeah, yeah, I got a five, seven, and nine year old. So, outside of work, when Liz and I are, uh, you know, be part of our family, you know, this those two things can consume us. You know, the business and you know, raising a raising a reasonably young family. And how was it starting a business with both of you involved in the business, having such a young, I mean, two months old? That's that's tough times at that time in life, right? Uh, yeah, but it was it was interesting because I think what I've learned um, is that how much control you have over your situation as a as an entrepreneur as a business owner mm-hmm. um, that actually you have more control um, and and probably I perceive as less risks if, if you are sort of a, in a face sense into your large corporate. So you know you have the ability to if you have to call a hundred people for a job, will you or a thousand people, you will. Yeah. So, um, so the, the the risk is all relative, and the stress is relative. So we, we were determined to make it. Um, so you know, there was never any option not to really. Sure. So yeah. Okay. And I'm really interested because you know a lot of people go into business with their partners, their wives, whatever. And the whole topic, happy wife, happy life, is not quite as its position. Yeah. It's more about how do you find that balance, but also more importantly, how do you, as you said, create that space for family and business when they are so. Um, entwined, you know. So, from yeah. the beginning to where you are now, I'm guessing if I ask Liz, she might have a, a story to tell as well. But how would you see that's played out? Uh, it's funny when I mentioned to her that this was the the, the topic of conversation. She kind of looked at me and and looked with a, a raised eyebrow. And I've got a number of um, very strong. Um, influential woman who are part of my team at work and they all laugh and think it's hilarious <laughs> that we're talking about this because because we're, not, we're definitely not the perfect couple, you know. Yeah. We all have our trials and tribulations. So I'm not going to pretend to you that, you know, we are the poster couple for anything really. So, um, but I, I think what we've learned um, in particular around how to manage a business and a family is a is a is a is a couple is really important around creating space, deliberate space, yeah, uh, and being very clear around roles and responsibilities. So, for example, I'm very much the CEO of the business, and Liz looks after all our people side too, backgrounds in HR, right? Um, and interestingly, Liz reports to someone else; she doesn't report to me. Nice. Move. So we keep um, things really, very deliberate around trying to create that space. Yeah. Um, we try very, very hard not to talk about business outside of um, outside of working hours. Yep. So um, one of the things that's really important for us is that, um, particularly for me, is I have to come home and decompress and not have to think about, you know, some of the challenges we have at work. And so that's one of the things we, those are two things that we try to do deliberately. Yep. And then it's also about how do we manage our time between us as a couple more effectively. And I don't think, um, I don't think, you know, last year wasn't a good example because we were kind of cocooned together and it wasn't. But, you know, um, as you know, we we try and be very deliberate around holidays. And one of the things we've always done is take three weeks off uh, mid-year, no phones, no emails. Where we, we, As a family, we go somewhere where we're away from things. So that normally entails us heading to somewhere like Australia where we just basically just can disconnect. Yeah. And my team can pick up the pieces. I, I can spend 100% focus and attention on uh, Liz and the kids. Um, so that's really important for us as a, yeah. as a couple to make sure we have very deliberate time away. Um, you know, after this podcast, um, I'm going to head to the beach and spend some time with the kids and we're going to probably right up till February. So we're in early January now. Um, how do I spend a bit of balanced time with the kids at the beach as well? So, yeah. Sure. And I suppose um, we, we learn from our mistakes, don't we? Yeah. You said that when we were we supposed to talk about this. What, what do you think have been the biggest kind of obstacles, challenges you've had, and then what have you learned from those along the way? In relation to our, you know, managing as a couple? Yeah, I think so. But yeah. also about the business a little bit as well, you know. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, when I think about the challenges we have, in particular, it always seems to be around people. Yeah. 
Um, and because Liz and I are quite emotional people, we are very emotionally invested in our team and their personal wellness and, and so forth like that. So when some of our team members are having challenges, we, we take that very personally and we try our best to resolve it. So it can be very tricky to disconnect ourselves from that emotional um, challenge that maybe our team members are going through. So yeah. that for us is, is, is key. I, I think what we've really learned um, – and, and going back to some of the work you're doing is is the importance of having um, a framework and structure and importance of mentors and those types of things when you're looking to scale and grow business. So we we got a um, I think one of the eureka things that we happened to us um, is we got a we I got involved in EO quite early on entrepreneurs organisation as you know, yep. um, but also we got a business coach quite early on as well. And we we were quite small at the time. We we're only doing about two or three hundred thousand dollars a year, but what it did is it set the it set the um, structure up for us to to scale and grow in a real sustainable way mm-hmm. that we weren't actually you know growing and creating more work for ourselves. We were backfilling stuff with people and systems and processes. We've been really clear around where our target market was, and I think what that did is allowed us um, a very straight, well, relatively st- comparatively stress free <laughs> way of scaling and growing. So that, that, I think that's one of the really key important things. It was actually one of the questions I've just written down. I was thinking about the fact that you take three or four weeks away. Yeah. And most entrepreneurs that I start working with kind of go, there's no way in the world I could take three or four yeah. weeks away. The business will fall down without me. And I suppose you've just answered that in some respects is if you put the systems and processes in place, you have the right people in the right seats, yeah. you've got everything sort of nicely structured, it actually gives you more freedom. Would that be fair to say? Oh, 100%. So, for example, example um the, the 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 holiday concept was one of my first mentors um he said you know what do we want to achieve this year and he, we talked about revenue growth and new customers and you know some personal stuff as well and and we were talking he goes you know what when was the last time you had a really decent holiday with your family mm-hmm. and i said well um, probably this this christmas has gone i said were you on your phone were you checking your computer i said yeah just about every day he said well why don't you set a goal within 12 months' time, you take um, two weeks' holiday, no phone, no emails. And it was a challenge to me. So what it meant to me was that I had to be really deliberate around selection of people. Mm-hmm. I had to find a tool I see in the business, someone who could deputise for me. I had to get a minimum of systems around in place in order for the business to continue without me. Um, and when I got home and explained to Liz, this is what you know, this is what I'm thinking. She she booked the holiday that night, <laughs> like literally. And we were we were going to go here, yeah. And this is what we were going to do. So it's been phenomenal. It's a really important part of um, our family routine. I said that strengthens the family, doesn't it? As well, oh, but having that time together. Yeah. yeah, and you're creating memories the whole time, so that you know we were, you know, you know, not really bummed, but we were disappointed we couldn't go away. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you know, but we've realised you know we've got some great options here. I mean. Kids are, you know, we can go to the mount, on from the mount originally and Pawanui and places like that. So, yep. you know, we shouldn't complain. Definitely not. I think we're in a very, very fortunate position over here yeah. at the moment. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay, what were the other sort of real big obstacles that you've kind of hit in the, is it seven, almost eight years now, isn't it? Yeah, eight years in April. Um, look, I, th- I think one of the challenges we face as a professional services business, and we and we kind of peaked a little bit, we had really good growth for the first five, six years uh, but the last two years we kind of stagnated, and I think what we're finding now is how do we productize? How do we how do we go away from selling time to creating experiences? Mm-hmm. And we invested quite heavily in developer products and experiences, and it's been it's been really good for us. What it meant is that we needed to really understand who we sold to and what are their core issues and challenges. Yeah, um, we need to be clear on who our customer was, our core customer. Uh, and then design an experience around that. And that meant so we could, rather than just selling time, we could create an experience, we could market an experience, we could train people in order to deliver these things. And then we just had our first dabble into digitising those experiences now. Oh, wow. So, you know, how do we create better scale through our business? So I, I, I'm really excited about um, 2021 in terms of where we're going. And, in fact, um, we've I think we learned a really good lesson. We actually recruited some people during the lockdown. Yep. We recruited a new principal, um, and it had been you know three principals, but actually getting a new principal who can run a business, who can run a, a subset of what we're trying to achieve, and the influence she's had, and it's been phenomenal, really. That's great. So yeah, I think we've got the courage now to in, invest and get some good people and, and pay top dollar for good people, but also be really clear about the products and services we're offering. 
And people, people really are everything in the business, aren't they? Hundred percent. You know, yeah. you know. What do you do if you've got the wrong person in the business? Have you ever had that experience? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, when you first start, and I needed somebody, I I met a guy at a pub that happened to be <laughs> loosely, you know, do a little bit of work in our space, and he was looking for work, and you know, I, I grabbed them. I was just really chuffed that anyone would want to come and spend time with me, you know, like as in my business because I didn't have, I didn't feel I had the credibility as a business. Um, but we're becoming more and more, we're absolutely very selective on on, on choosing the right people. Yep. Um, and we have a very values-based approach. And one of the things we were very clear on early on was how do we define our values? And values are really important because they become the unofficial playbook of how you run a business. So for the processes and procedures, if you empower your staff to make a decision based on values, that's all you can do, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I think strange. values have been a little bit overused in corporate and they tend to be things that get stuck on the wall on a screen oh, saver and people pay no attention to them. So how do you keep those values alive in the business? So that's the playbook, but how do you hold people to yeah. that? Or Well, I, I think the story of our values, and we probably need to just touch on that briefly. I mean, yep. there was one of our graduates who said to us, look, you know, I think values are important. And I come from a military, which is a very values-based organisation, and where you really abide and live by your values. And then I got in this corporate world where actually to be fair, it was quite transactional. So we, we abide by our values, but actually, you know what, if we're not making enough money, then we won't. Yeah. So I was kind of like uh, a bit sceptical, but, you know, um, I owe it to Lucy Olsen, who's in Germany at the moment, um, for the fact that she persevered and we, we pressed on. But it was a game changer for us. Um, and how we bring our values alive, it starts with a recruitment process. So we have a uh, an element of competency, but actually what we're tr- trying to choose is the right person. So the right set of values to align with that type of person. Yeah. Um, so if we get the right values in, we can build competency, no problem at all. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And in terms of bringing them alive, it's really important. So we, we have things like values-based stories uh, every Tuesday at our team meeting. So we had some this morning. Um, but also our morning huddle is really important as well. So I think if, you, if, you, if you're trying to create an environment where uh, people feel comfortable, then how do you create a level of vulnerability within your business as well? Yeah. So it's really important um, with our huddle, which is a, it's a quick catch up where what do you do last 24, what do you do next 24, any stacks. Yep. So what are the issues or concerns? Yeah, I think that the, the trick is um, to implementing that thinking is is for the, the, the leaders of the business to be vulnerable first. Yep. So you've got to show uncertainty to your team and where you're uncertain. So what that does is send a clear message to everybody that it's okay to be uncertain. And that reinforces those values, particularly if you want people to be open, honest and transparent. Perfect. And I suppose, you know, 2020 certainly was a roller coaster year, wasn't it? Um, there must have been yeah. times where you perhaps wondered what was going on and where this would go to. So a bit of vulnerability here. What would you say is the worst point in 2020 for you? Uh, a bit off topic. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I probably just touching, I'm just going a little bit tangent here, but, yeah. I, I, you know, normally our huddle's really quick. Um, normally it's about eight to ten minutes for the whole for whole company to get together and just smash through it. Yeah. But we found during the lockdown that our huddle would extend to half an hour, three quarters of an hour, because people were just expressing how they were uncertain or concerned. Um, and actually, what's interesting is sometimes um, uh, for you know not necessarily for everyone, but you know there were times where I thought that possibly. Um, where the anchor was for some of our staff was with with their work colleagues as opposed to the environment they might have been sitting in uh, remotely. Yeah. So, again, um, you know, just observing um, the power of of vulnerability and the safe place for people to work. I think communication became key, didn't it? So, obviously, you you had communication before pre-COVID, if you like, and then throughout the lockdown. How do you keep the communication lines open between you and your wife, given that, you know, you try to keep things in in business hours? Yeah. Um, And and with the whole team, a wider team, you know, what do you do to make sure that things are being communicated well? Yeah, look, it's – look, I don't think we've got this sorted out at all. So – Probably when I look at the way Liz and I have had um, discussions and how we've interacted last year, it's been really, really tough for us because we haven't had really that time out yeah. as a couple that we'd like to do. One of the really cool things we did um, and probably the best day in my last year was, well, it was the best day, without a doubt, is that after our um, our work function, Liz and I just stayed in a hotel in the city for two days. Nice. Yeah, just – and then, you know, we had kids looked after – and on the Saturday, we just went to Rangi Toto and we worked around and up Rangi Toto, went out for lunch, you know, just kind of really spent some time together. So 
that we need to be more deliberate in those t- creating those opportunities for us as a couple just to spend time. Yeah. And it's and you know that's really cool. Um, as a team, um, we're quite structured around how we communicate. So we have our morning huddles, which is quite important. Yeah. Um, and then we have our team meetings on Tuesdays, which is very much a tactical, slightly strategic meeting. Yeah. And those are those key points around our our, our day. Um, and then we have another round of the meetings like sales meetings and cash flow meetings. So those are kind of our deliberate points of contact. But, you know, it's always being about having that open door policy so anyone can feel free to come and have a chat to you if they're uncertain or concerned. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Love it. Hey, I think that's wonderful. I think we're just about at time. Doesn't it go quickly when oh, you're wow. enjoying yourself? You yeah. But we did <laughs> promise, we promised our, our, our listeners that we would actually give them three tips they could take away oh. that they could put into action um, almost immediately. So just talking about some of the things we've talked about, what would you say your top kind of three tips are for keeping that space for both your personal and professional life? Uh, look, I, I probably, I think if you get the business right yep. in terms of the way the business runs, then it creates more time and space for you to invest back into your family. And you mentioned getting a coach early on, yeah. having structures, operating system, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, probably not three, but, you know, just just see how we go. But, you know, for us around getting a business coach, around having, I have a business coach, I have a mentor. Um, I have EO, which is um, entrepreneurs have a thing called Forum, where people come together and share experiences. So I have three mechanisms in which I can share some of the anxieties or the challenges I'm facing as a as a business owner outside of my media work. We also have an advisory board as well. Yep. So, you know, I invest heavily in terms of um, external people to provide support and guidance for me. Yeah. Um, and I think what's really interesting about that is that it allows me to work smarter, not necessarily harder. And, you know, the, the situation with, you know, our business coach and how that really transformed the way we ran our business was, was really significant. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing I think you can't underestimate the importance of, you know, values-based people within your organisation. And, 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 and I think that is very cliche about, you know, getting the right people on the bus, but it's so true. You know, one good person can make, significant difference to your business yeah and likewise one person who's not great oh. can destroy a business quite quickly i agree yeah. yeah so the values are really really key so how do we create a, a, a culture of vulnerability things like the huddle we talked about yep. re, re, reinforcing values-based stories um because you've got to teach people how to do this stuff you've got to teach people um, that are new to your business around what it is to work for our organization be part of our team mm-hmm. so it's really really important um what else did i write Oh, I, I just wrote learning, actually. Yeah. You know, it's really important. Um, so I, I probably do one or two days of learning every month, whether it be through forum or some sort of virtual learning or reading. So it's something I, I really enjoy. And I think being very deliberate around taking time to learn and be away from your business is, is really key. So there's probably three things that are, have, I think, really helped us in terms of, um, in terms of, Growing and, and, and growing a scalable business. Like, for example, learning the flywheel from Jim Collins, you yes. know, read about that. And it's something I really wanted to implement, you know, but it took time to read about it, understand it, and so forth like that. Perfect. Read any good books recently? Yeah, I have actually. A Bezonomics by um, Brian Germain. Okay. So it's a story about Amazon and um, Jeff Bezos's. Oh, yes. Um, I read, I oh, thank you. I read um, Getting a Grip by Gina Wickman in the holidays. And I read, um, uh, the big uh, the the, uh, the answers to the big questions by Stephen Hawking. So I'm interested. Ooh. I'm an engineer, so I'm yes. quite curious about <laughs> physics and so forth like that. Um, yeah, and some trashy novels. Of course. It's yeah. holiday, for God's sake. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that is awesome. Hey, look, Warner, really, really appreciate you being my first guest and yes. coming in and sharing so vulnerably and, and giving people some insight yeah. into your business and how you got there. So thank you very much. Um, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, Deborah. Thank Take you. Care.